at Sheffield Hallam. And, and in my short time at IOE, I, I must pay tribute to his leadership. He's been a wonderful director for me and for everyone, I think. Uh, can I also acknowledge um, Phil Rickard and John Polisort from University of Melbourne, colleagues from, from, from a long way back now. And, and uh, particularly, I want to uh, express my, my pleasure to see Phil here. Phil was such a wonderful mm. dean of education when I was at Melbourne. Um, and continues to go from success to success. The last grant round was, was, was the best I think Melbourne's had in the time I've had a connection to the university, in, in education anyway. Um, also, I want to acknowledge Glenn Jones and JC Shin, close colleagues, uh, colleagues who I work with actively on a number of projects, and not, none of those projects are dependent on funding. And I think, you know, that's the kind of international collaboration which really matters, you know, when you want to work together and you continue to talk to each other regardless of whether there's an economic driver or not. And in fact, you can be, in the nature of universities is you can be remarkably productive in a scholarly sense by assembling, often by assembling empirical research, which has been produced in other domains, um, you know, without funding, uh, through contemporary communication. What I'd like to do today is share a few thoughts with you about um, participation and stratification of participation what you might call participation and equity. Equity with its double meaning of um, <coughs> inclusion, where we're doing pretty well and providing everyone with a fair start in life where we're not doing quite as well in higher education. Uh, it's a complex problem, education and society, as all of us who work as sociologists know. Um, so I've developed a theoretical map, which I hope can guide our thinking today. Oh, <laughs> well, I hope you can read the slide. <laughs> Actually, it could take a long time to explain this diagram. I think on second thoughts we might go to something more simple. Um, now, this is what I plan to cover. and uh, I want to use this as a, as a seminar rather than a lecture. I mean, I think the, the format and your expertise suggest a seminar is appropriate rather than a lecture. So, I'm going to lay out some data in different areas, um, pr put forward some propositions about interpretation, invite your sharing of that, and invite your thoughts. So feel free to come in at any point. I'm not going to have a specific question and answer discussion format, but feel free to interrupt and to raise issues. But we do have quite a long time scheduled for this, so we can um, do a fair bit of talking after I finish as well. So first I want to talk about three macro trends in higher education. And when I talk about higher education, I'm actually using the American definition, tertiary education in the OECD sense, inclusive of two-year diploma level courses as well as three or four-year degrees and above. So it's that larger um, set of data. And I, I'm compelled to do that, firstly, because I think that the American approach in this respect is right. I mean, I think we should include, uh, we shouldn't make a distinction of of high status between two and three year programs. Um, and secondly, uh, the, uh, the, the UNESCO participation data are tertiary participation data. And um, we, you can extract from the UNESCO data degree level participation as well, but the many countries don't provide that, that do provide tertiary. So we work with tertiary. And I think tertiary is more meaningful anyway. It, um, award courses post school. Okay, so the first trend I want to talk about is growth, growth of participation towards what I think is a universal trend or near universal trend or across the world to high participation systems of higher education, systems with more than 50% of the age cohort entering higher education, not necessarily graduating, but entering. Now, the, the growth curve is, in the last 15 years, quite remarkable. And I don't think we've done enough thinking about what this means worldwide. We know what it means in our own countries. But ne nearly every country growth is occurring. In most countries, rapid growth is occurring, uh, except for countries which earn less than about 7,000 USD per person and on a national income basis. Now, it's interesting to look at the history. The, bottom, the dotted line gives you world population growth. GDP has grown at almost twice the rate, real GDP has grown at almost twice the rate of pop as population. Tertiary enrolment moved more or less lockstep with GDP until about 1991. And then it began to peel away and it began to climb. 
And you can see from the slope there that it's apart from the last little blip at the top, which partly reflects the drop in participation in the US data, um, that the, the, the most rapid growth has been in the last 10 years. This is the gross tertiary enrolment ratio, which is the, the numerator is the um, total enrolment, the denominator is the age cohort. So it tends to exaggerate age cohort participation because it, the numerator includes mature age participation. And in some countries that's more of an exaggeration than others. You also have effects related to international student movements in and out of the countries as well. So countries with a lot of international students like the UK or Australia tend to have exaggerated, quite grossly exaggerated participation figures and Australia and the UK don't look nearly as good once you take the international students out. But in most countries, that, the international effect is not great. Um, mature age effect varies, but um, the good thing about using GTER data is it does give you trends and it gives you rough comparisons across countries as well. What's interesting about it is the way in which the participation growth accelerates. As I just said, pointed out, you've got 10% you know, participation in 1970, you've got 14% in 1990, so very little change in those 20 years, or 40% increase but from a low base. And then it starts to climb, and it's soon climbing at 1% a year. 1% a year doesn't sound much, but 1% a year is 20% growth in 20 years. And in some countries, of course, it's been much more dramatic than that. That's an average figure. In North America and Western Europe as a block, almost four, four uh, people in every five in the age cohort now attend some form of tertiary education, four in five. The notion that people aren't educable seems to have gone. There's an assumption that nearly everyone is educable, I think, in that. In Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the other end of the, of the comparison on participation rates, it's still, participation is still very low, below 10% in the region, but it has increased at much the same rate as the world rate, that is, it's doubled in the last 15 years. Here's the regional picture, and you can see that in every region except C Central Asia, uh, the gross tertiary enrollment ratio is accelerating. The Arab states perhaps not as rapid as the other areas also, but East Asia and the Pacific, if you take out China, it's over 50%. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, in, in, a, in a number of countries, it's over 70%. Uh, and it's really the, the smaller island nations and the poorest continental nations like Bolivia and Paraguay which are holding the overall big picture down. But in Chile, Venezuela, Brazil, you know, participation is growing rapidly. Um, Central and Eastern Europe has always been not far behind North America and Western Europe. So, but the pattern of overall growth is stunning. And there's more. Oh, that's a pity. <laughs> That was your best slide, too. Well, it was an interesting one. Let's see if I can restore things. It's completely dropped out. Yeah, good. Back again. Ah, thank you for your excellent technical advice. I will try and avoid doing it again. Um, now, now, what's interesting about gross participation at the global level is that really big population countries are seeing a major shift. I mean, three of the four largest nations, Indonesia, China, India. In those, all three nations, we're now seeing, uh, well, in Indonesia, more than a third. In China, about a third. In fact, on the latest figures, a bit higher, I think. Um, and in... Uh, India coming up to 30% gross tertiary enrolment ratios. And what's driving the growth is the movement of people from the countryside to the cities. S similar things are happening in sub-Saharan Africa in the large and populated nations there as well. They're further behind the participation curve, but the same dynamic of people going to the cities, getting jobs, becoming quasi-middle class or a little, you know, less than that. But cities are where tertiary education is provided. Um, schools are provided often in rural areas, but tertiary education may, tends to concentrate in larger cities. And, um, and also middle class demand can be effective politically, it can concentrate there as well. So you have a, all the dynamic of growth, middle class growth, in the, the concentrating in the cities. Um, and 
you will see a massive increase in those three countries on all the indicators that we currently have. Short of a world war or some other cataclysm, this is going to go on. Um, and so when it's in Indonesia, China, India, double their participation rate, then you know the, the demography of educated labour right around the world changes and those nations start to provide a high proportion of professionals in many countries. So a very significant development. So in summary, you've got more than 100 systems at the mass education level that Martin Trout talked about, 15% participation. You've got more than 50 systems now at 50% participation, which he's called universal. And what he meant by universal was families need to participate. Uh, they can no longer afford to stay out of the system because of the penalties extracted on their children if they do. Uh, that you need tertiary education for normal, full-time, sub-professional or professional work. Um, and, uh, and you need it for social status in societies where the majority of people, or, or a near majority, are going to acquire it. Um, it's really striking that in countries well below the average um, GDP per capita, uh, that this same rapid growth is occurring. Now, I'm going to put more qualifications into participation as we go, but um, let me just say now the thought that will have occurred to you that a lot of what we call participation that's mentioned in the statistics is not very strong educationally. Um, some of it's just online, some of it's online without teaching. Um, a lot of it's in diploma mills, especially in the emerging countries, but also in the United States. Um, so so that, we keep that in mind, but before we concentrate on the dark side, um, let's just reflect on the, on, the, on the good side. We have done a remarkable thing in education, schooling and higher education. We are creating a worldwide high participation society. Um, as in, in that circumstance, not only do people have greater agency in the labour market and in life, and not only do women have the capacity to control their infertility, for example, because they're educated, not only those things, um, also, it means that you have a high level of political participation, um, a high level of political awareness, uh, and um, you have uh, the potential, I think, for much more international commonality, because tertiary education is a homogenising force. It, it brings people into a framework which is similar worldwide in many respects. The structure of qualifications, the nature of instruction and, and learning, um, the, uh, the processes of certification and so on are similar worldwide, I mean, like engineering for example. Just as a caveat to, as, as general participation expands, so does cross-border activity and cross-border mobility is doubling every 10 years. It means that there will be many, many more international students in future, future than there are now, although for the exporting countries that raises the question of where they will go and how good the students will be that go to them. Simon, so can I just clarify yes. one point? I, I'm pretty sure you've mentioned it, but when we talk about participation, it's any time in a person's lifetime? Um, the, We're talking about uh, yes, the GTR, into higher peers. Yeah, the GTR will capture any enrolment. So, so, and I think you did mention it before, but I just didn't quite grab it. So how much, given where we were and where we are now, how much of that growth is, I'll call it older age groups, yeah. those in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s, catching up on what they might have done had they been born to, you know, 20 years ago rather than 60 years ago. To answer the question, well, would take some time, um, and I can't do it on the spot, but I could just essay some general thoughts about how much that factor is playing out. Uh, my, in most countries, tertiary education is still understood as a young person's thing. In the Scandinavian countries, English-speaking countries, um, increasingly Korea and Taiwan, mature age entry is playing a larger role. Okay. No, um, that's enough. So, uh, I mean, what, Korea's got fantastic participation, it's the world leader. Um, and I think the, uh, my guess would be, J JC, you can correct me, um, that the real age cohort participation is probably 90%. But the, but, but the um, GTR figures take it over 100 because of the mature age factor. Uh, so you have this funny thing, well, Greece has got 115% participation because I think everyone's, everyone's in the workforce needs to be enrolled nominally. With <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there must be some social service benefit associated with that. Um, 
But you know, it, it, yes, that, that fact is a really, really relevant one, and I've been, and I'm Absolutely. using quite crude data with the GCR, no, but I want to look at the big picture, and it gives me a good summary. So, but you're quite right to ask the question. My sense is that mature age participation is more important than it was 20 years ago overall, um, but I doubt if that figures a large effect at a world level. Okay. Now, why? Why this phenomenal expansion? Is it just our good marketing campaigns that's generating this? Is it the benign influence of government that seeks to help its population? Um, you know, what, what is it? What are, is it demand in the economy that's driving the need for higher skill, ever higher skills, ever higher levels of work? Um, I suspect not. Let's run through the possible explanations. And this, of course, is a very open question. Well, first, I've done a number of um, inquiries into the relationship between economic growth and um, uh, participation trends. This slide has the 33 countries with the, that have seen the largest growth in the GTR. I mean, led by Albania, where the GTR over this 10-year period jumped 40%, um, going all the way down to that low-growth country, China, you know, where it jumped um, almost 20% in 10 years. Uh, so there's a lot in between. Some of them are, are substantial economies and societies. Some of them are small ones. Um, but you know, Argentina, Iran, Turkey, these are, Chile, these are not negligible nation states. Um, so, so massive growth in many places is one part of that, this story. But the other thing is, see where the GDP and average annual growth figures are, they're all over the place. I subsequently took the 20 largest population countries and then correlated that systematically against, um, you know, it's correlated enrolment trend growth against GDP growth. And there is a line of best fit which shows a slight slope. So um, there is a, 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 loose, a weak correlation um, between economic growth rates and participation growth. But it's only, only weak. It's not as strong as another correlation I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, Schofer and Mayer... Uh, are the first, really, the only substantial article in the literature on, on, on this worldwide pattern of growth. 2005, American Sociological Review, did a, did a historical analysis where they found that in the 60s there was a weak correlation between economic growth and growth of participation. But after the 60s, once you get through the initial development of mass education, that correlation largely disappears. So the relationship between economic growth in their study and um, participation growth was, 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 was weak to neg negligible. In countries with widely varying industry configurations, you know, high, high school manufacturing like Taiwan, Korea, or you know, Germany or Finland, uh, countries with high, high service economies like the United States, um, from you know, countries where ec unemployment is high, um, all countries really, except those which continue to retain very large agricultural sectors, uh, you see high growth. So from a huge, in a huge range of different industry configurations, different skill sets, different labour market requirements, you see high growth. Um, so something else is happening apart from pull from the economy. The human capital equation is beginning to look shaky. I will try and shake it further. Is the state the driver? Well, yes and no. In what the state seems to play a, 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 the, the central role in the movement from elite to mass education. The state makes the decision at that point in almost every case to create infrastructure, to train tertiary teachers, to encourage, in some cases, research at that early stage and so on. Establish a framework of institutions which can, 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 can accept demand. The middle class sees the opportunities, starts to express demand maybe starts to enrol domestically rather than sending its children abroad in some cases. Uh, and then once that dynamic of growth is established, it doesn't seem to reverse. And it seems to become self-sustaining. And this is the Tro's argument about participation, that as it grows, it, as I said before, it becomes more and more necessary to families to the point where when it reaches the universal stage in his calculation, the 50% stage, what I call the high participation systems stage, it becomes um, quasi-compulsory for all but the poorest families. Um, so that dynamic of growth um, seems to be, seems to, at a certain point in the growth cycle, become self-sustaining, and the state no longer has to 
provide finance or other incentives to encourage people to be in tertiary education. In the case of poorer families, it may have to do so. In the case of underrepresented groups, it may have to do so. In the case of women in engineering, it may have to do so and so on. But, and particularly rural and isolated students, not just low income families, but rural and isolated. State may still have to, have to work on participation at the margin, but the, the core of participation, the urban middle class growth, once established, doesn't seem to be reversible. And that's what's interesting. No country has ever reversed the tendency to growth, high participation. You get situations where it plateaus for a while, and sometimes it drops a little, but it goes back up again. The, 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 the dynamic is unstoppable. So the state, is, state continues to facilitate it, but the state also finds that despite you know, the, the growth, it can, can find ways of reducing the cost to, the, to itself by transferring part of the cost to the user and the family. And while that's not a universal trend, and there's significant parts of Europe where tuition is free, for example, um, Mexico, there's been a long running battle over that issue, and so on. Nonetheless, I think in about half of the countries, you can see a tendency to increasing private cost. I said before that the correlation between economic growth and um, participation growth was weak, but the correlation between urbanisation, the percentage of the population that's urban, which is an increasing factor or everywhere, and the um, percentage of the gross tertiary enrolment ratio, the correlation between those two percentage figures is very good. That's the line of best fit. I've arranged the um, 20 most populous countries in the world, although I had, didn't have data before them and had to substitute the next, the next four. Um, and I've, I've, the, the grey line is the, is the percentage of the population in urban areas, and the, um, the bars are the GTER, and you can see the line of best fits very clear. I mean, there's nations where, like South Korea, USA, where participation is higher than urbanisation, there's nations where, like um, Mexico, Indonesia, China, still, uh, Pakistan, Congo, where participation is lower than urbanisation would suggest, but the overall pattern is, is very strong. And I think this goes back to the point I made before, that, that demand concentrates in cities, it concentrates led by the middle class and then the lower middle class and then everyone begins to come in. Uh, and the political pressure is put on to provide infrastructure for tertiary education in the cities. We haven't seen nothing yet, as Al Jolson said, we haven't seen nothing yet. Um, the growth of the middle class projected by the, in the famous Brookings OECD projection 20, 2010 was for an increase from in Asia alone from half a billion in 2009 to 3.2 billion in 2030. That is a six, almost six times, or about six times. Um, the Brookings figure has been questioned. The World Bank has a more conservative figure, but the World Bank figure involves over the same 21 year period about an increase of more than uh, a multiplication of, of uh, to twice, more than twice the size of the global middle class. Now, that means a multiplication in those who are able to effectively put pressure on their governments to demand tertiary education places, a multiplication in those who can afford to share part of the cost of tertiary education, both through taxation and through private funds. So the dynamic of growth will continue, but much of that, that bulk comes from India and China. Okay, the this second trend I want to point, to point to is the spread of the movement for world-class universities and the spread of research across, out of its traditional zone of North America, Western Europe, Japan, Russia, Australia, to a much larger number of countries. Ironically, the spread of national research capacity is a function of globalisation. Globalisation has created a single um, world research system. So that the, the dominant research in the sciences and parts of the social sciences is the global conversation in, in the English language. And while it's true that the national research conversation is still more important than the humanities, in languages, in some of the, the professional social sciences perhaps, maybe not business studies, but the other areas, nonetheless, the, you know, the science is a major driver of, of this process. And, Science, of course, is tremendously important for nations in the nation building process, science and technology. The, the lodestone is always applied science, the capacity to create and facilitate innovation, 
But to have an innovative capacity, as Malaysia found out to its cost, you have to have basic research capacity as well. You have to have your own PhD um, training capacity. You have to be able to join the conversation, get access to the knowledge as it arises, be part of the process of knowledge formation. Otherwise, you're not in the circuit. You're not part of the system. So to be part of that system, you need, you need a national system as well. So more and more nations are developing research, um, developing um, PhD training of their own in some disciplines or all disciplines and so on. And that also brings with it the incentive to develop world-class universities. And of course, the Shanghai ranking has played an enormous role in providing a kind of ideological framework for all of this. By giving people a, a neat definition of a, a world-class university in the top 500 as measured by the Shanghai Jiatong. And the Shanghai Jiatong is driven by basic science. I mean, it's true that the performance in the Shanghai Jiatong ranking is above all carried by the big applied science areas, medicine and engineering, but the characteristic of those fields is that they also need life science and physical sciences underpinning them. So you need, you actually need a fully developed research system. I don't know whether Nian Tsi Lu knew what he was doing when he created, you know, these incentives, but he, he, did, he did want to orientate us all to thinking about basic science. He has made that clear. And he succeeded. Now, everyone wants to be in the, in the peak group. It's like having nuclear power or a very wealthy economy. Everyone wants this, um, but no one can get it really, except the United States and the United Kingdom and one, one or two others. The Swiss, the Canadians can penetrate the group, but it's, um, that's the sort of lodestone. That's what everyone's been driven towards. Just by the way, it's a complicated table. Let me just point out a couple of things to you. Total number of papers in the top 10%. Harvard, 6,892. Next best, Stanford, 3,883. Harvard is a total giant. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Um, the, uh, and just by the sheer, the sheer number of papers, too, look at, I mean, Toronto, which is a, a huge university, as Glenn well knows, um, has got less than two thirds of papers at Harvard. Michigan's big too. But um, that's where one wants to go, but it's hard to get there. But some nations are moving sharply on both participation growth and research growth. China, of course, is the obvious example, but Iran is actually the nation which is seeing the most rapid growth in science, uh, mainly in the physical sciences, mainly in the, in the strategic sciences. There's also rapid growth going on in parts of Southeast Asia and Turkey. Tunisia, you know, new kid on the block as far as research systems go. But these, apart from Thailand, all of these nations see rapid growth in both, at both the mass education level and in the output of research universities. Now let's see how that maps. 37 systems have a GTR of more than 50% high participation systems, and they have at least one top 500 university. And that's that list of systems. All the Anglosphere, a good chunk of European systems, only a small number of which are, have large numbers of uh, research universities, and um, the emerging East Asian region. China's not here because China's GTR is not yet at 50%. Chile is an up-and-comer in the Latin American context. We don't have data for Brazil um, in that table because the Brazil figures are here. There are seven systems that have WCUs but their GTR is below 50%. Now that's not, oh, they're obvious candidates for high stratification. Um, China is the most important, but Brazil where we don't have a participation figure but it's below 50 um, is, is the second most important. South Africa, a good example of a highly unequal country which has significant research universities on top. Then there's a bunch of systems that have 50% participation but no WCUs, but they're mostly small countries. I mean, we shouldn't spend too long talking about San Marino and Palau here. Um, they're just, they're not likely to get world-class universities. Though you were, Thailand has sometimes had Chil Long Pond uh, in the top 500 group. Kazakhstan is working very hard, as some will know, to get there as well. Um, Cuba has extraordinary research, but no WCUs are not likely to get, get, get any. Ukraine has been interrupted. Um, the Baltic states are, too, are, are very small. They've got very impressive social indicators, but they are small. 
The third trend I want to point to is the ever-growing importance of East Asia, and I still have to dwell on this, but I think in this group, perhaps you know more about it than most of my colleagues in the UK, but I'm still trying to educate on this point. We still, looked, we still look at Europe, because that's where we get our, our big research grants, that's where the UK does so well. And we don't look at East Asia much because it's a long way away. When I was in Australia, we looked at East Asia all the time. I'm now talking about the Sinic cultural sphere, the sphere of Chinese civilization, and that includes Vietnam as well, uh, as the obvious candidates, China, Macau, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore as a predominantly Sinic enclave, um, and it's sort of South Korea and Japan, and I'll justify that in a moment. Um, you can trace a lot of the core values and core orientations that are now making East Asian higher education so successful from its, its civilizational origins, the strong state, comprehensive state of the Han period, and then the um, extension of the influence of Sonic civilization to Korea and Japan. Korea, then Japan, Japan through Korea. And uh, the, it's striking how in traditional Japanese culture, which is so well preserved in Kyoto and other places, you can, still, you can see recognisable Tang cultural motives. And it's, um, in many respects, Japan, Korea and China are quite different places now. Politically, yes, but also in other ways too. But the influence of, of, of Tang and then Neo-Confucian um, uh, ideas in Japan and Korea is very striking. What are the features that underpin the rise of East Asia? Well, I think the, the role of the state is, is less subject to, to constant questioning than it is in the American and English language polities. Anti-statism is not built into the political fabric, this sort of notion of the limited state and, and the standoff between the market as the realm of freedom and, or the civil society and the state, on the other hand. Not, it's not really part of the, of the, of the um, conceptual apparatus of the political cultures of East Asia. There's more, there's more support for the mission of the state, which is to provide prosperity and order, uh, and, and to take responsibility for a broader range of things, than, including innovation, education, research, and so on, um, than in some um, countries outside the region. On the other hand, the state doesn't take responsibility for some things which are in the domain of the family, but are in the domain of the state in other jurisdictions, like aspects of welfare and aged care. So it, it does vary, but in, in the area of education and research and science, the state is right in the middle of the picture, regardless of whether it's private sector or public sector, regardless of whether it's privately funded or publicly funded. And of course, the, um, the dynamic of Confucian self-cultivation in the, in the home. Um, the core values of education are part of life from the beginning in a way which doesn't occur anywhere else in the world and this creates a profound educated capacity in the population. Even very poor families will put all of their extra money into education. American families might spend a third of their income on housing, a family in China or Korea will spend maybe a third of their income on education. Um, so you have different values. Uh, and education more important, more central, and of course the role of examination as a sorting device, as a meritocratic device to a degree, um, and that of course is where the examination comes from. Um, in this period of modernisation and catch up to the West, modernisation of education systems has been central, um, incessant reform and improvement, um, lifting of professional development standards in schools, and, and you know, combine that with the incentive to learn at the level of the family, the incentive to use education as a ladder uh, as well, and you have these fantastic present results. I think these are well known to everyone. But you know, the top seven systems in, in mathematics are, are all in East Asia and so on, but it's also in reading. It's not just STEM. It's about language as well. And now um, European levels of participation are better, with South Korea and Taiwan being amongst the really outstanding systems in terms of you know, near universal or universal participation. Um, Hong Kong and Singapore have now come up to majority level participation. We don't have a number for Singapore because it's a secret. But uh, there's two secret systems. There's Canada, which never tells you anything because it doesn't have national agencies. And there's Singapore, which doesn't tell you anything because it doesn't want you to know. You know? Um, but, and China, well, these are the 2011 figures, well, recent figures between 9% and for 2013. So, and China, we think, will reach its 
um, 2020 target of 40%. R&D, European levels of R&D spending, percentage of GDP, I mean South Korea especially, second highest in the world after uh, Israel, and uh, in Japan continues, Japan has its problems in this, in this period as we all know, but continues to be a stellar performer in terms of R&D investment and significant innovator in key areas of industry. Um, these are just the OECD figures, and you can pick them up off the web. But um, I always I like the way that you see the boutique European economy sort of mirrored in Asia, on, except the, the, the East Asian countries are on a larger scale, mostly. So um, Russia, Russia's an interesting standard. Oh, we we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but really, so had we looked back in sort of 10-year chunks, what, what the trend line might have been, and uh, I just find that fascinating. Russia's, it's, it's an amazing story. I mean, it's it's a fascinating set of problems, and with no obvious solution in sight. Mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, Isaac Froman would like to join this group and have, have talk talk to you further about it. Um, but he's aware of the problems as everyone else is. But it doesn't seem to move forward. Um, the, the number of science papers coming out of Russia has been going down, you know, for about a decade. I mean, they inherited obviously they inherited this very strong applied military engineering and and and, and uh, physics and a related research capacity, which is just a road. I mean, once the uh, changeover occurred in 1992, the Soviet Union collapsed, then all the salaries in research institutes disappeared, and except in the, in the strongest institutions in the national sense, like Moscow State University and the Academy of Sciences, and even parts of that um, were affected, you know, the, all the smaller institutes and, you know, either went, went on the market, you know, went out of research and did other things, or try to uh, you know build an applied research and industry agenda, um, and uh, uh, people left left in droves. The younger people, especially the younger the talent that was coming through in the late eighties, ninety, early nineties, left much of it. There's still that uh, there's still that capacity in physics. I mean, there's areas where you know, applied physics, but more theoretical physics, nuclear, um, where there's where there's still really good people in Russia, but nothing like what it was. So. So are, there any, are there any political signs that they might try and change? They talk this? about world-class universities. They've got a world-class university program, um, five in the top 100. It's totally unachievable in their present conditions and settings. Um, it's like Malaysia was about 20 years ago. It's all rhetoric and no substance. Sure. I mean, Malaysia did get there, so you can get out of that state. Um, I don't know about Russia. I mean, there's much larger issues there. I mean, the, 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 sh the swing to a resource-based so, uh, and, and rent and rent based economy has been you know obviously part of the problem the sort of um, de, de intellectualization uh, that's occurred uh, Russia still does very well on some tests at school level of mathematical capacity and produces lots of great test players but you know you can't help feeling that there's something very strong in the culture which isn't coming through in the education system or in the university science performance but the science figures are dismal I interviewed there a lot in 2013, and um, I went to one engineering university, where um, you know, which was obviously very, you know, had very good people, but they were all doing research in Russian for uh, applied purposes for the metallurgy industry. Uh, none of, not much of it was being published. A lot of it was being circulated. They had a kind of scientific community, and I think that's how they used to operate in the Soviet time. They did everything in Russian. They didn't put anything outside to the outside world because that was strategically a bad idea, as they saw it. And they've still got this idea. And I had this, I had, I had a kind of discussion with someone from the, the consulate here in London about this very issue. They still believe that they should take in the research from everyone else, turn it into Russian, um, but they shouldn't put their own research out there because then they'll give others an advantage. They still believe that. They don't understand that connecting to the rest of the world is how you actually function in this environment. Otherwise, you can't function effectively. They don't understand internationalization. And the thing that, that um, that China and Singapore have understand so well, you know, about about the need to internationalise to be able to catch up and compete. Um, that Russia's just outside that all that framework, just can't think it through. I don't know what it is, but you see it also in Japan. You know, you see it there as well. Um, this kind of national bandedness, but it's worse in Russia. So, so Simon, just before you move on, is that just public investment, or does that include? That's a whole space? lot, um, except Switzerland figure doesn't have private investment because they don't have the number. Um, the others have all got public and private. So it's quite high for places like Germany and Denmark where it's, it's almost entirely public? Yeah, basically, although in Germany there's a bit of industry investment as well. Because, you know, strong high quality manufacturing, you know, does, does sustain some R&D. Yeah. Um, 
the, the ratios really vary, like the role of universities really varies. For example, in the UK, it's almost 30% university funding. In um, China, it's 8%. Most of it's in the state enterprises. Uh, although they do work, though the universities do work for them. So you know, some of the university work shows up in the state enterprise income figures. In the US, 16 to 18% in the universities. And Australia's about the same. So it, it does vary, and these figures have got very different means in terms of industry R&D especially. And of course, what industry R&D is is also a problem because you know you have the Australian situation which inch up, as chief scientists always used to say, I don't believe the R&D figures because it's all just a tax lurk, really. Um, so it's, it's a claim about taxation, you know, people putting all kinds of costs onto that and, and calling it R&D. So you don't really know, but um, those factors vary by nation and that's the problem with standardised figures. But, um, you know, you need to break this down further to get a real picture of what it does. But I think the aggregate matters because it tells you about the size of the R&D labour force, um, probably gives you a hint about, correlates fairly closely with publication output, and it correlates fairly closely with public investment as well. So. Um, as the inputs increase, the outputs increase, and the basic science in China has just gone up like a rocket. 16% um, rate of increase in research papers, new research papers coming out. That's quantity, not quality of research, but it's a pretty important figure. Um, although you can't see it clearly because the numbers are lower and the, so the slope appears less, South Korea, Taiwan and Singapore, the rate of growth is again rapid. Not as rapid as China, but, but still rapid. The thing that's really interesting, I think, about East Asia is the quality improvement. Um, and this has all happened in the last 15 years. In the case of China, chemistry, for example, probably China's strongest ma major discipline, although computing um, research is even stronger than chemistry. Um, in the year 2000, China published 3.7% of the world's papers in chemistry. In the year 2012, 12 years later, it was jumped to 16.9. But what's more important is that the share of top 1% papers, one percent, top 1% 1 by citation, has gone up from 0.6, which is a small figure, to 16.3. I mean, it's a rate of, it's almost unimaginable rate of influence. And this is an aggregate effect across the whole system. Simon, sorry, is that partly self-sustaining? Self-citation? Because you grows Chinese chemists cite other Chinese chemists. Yes. I think national systems, the US and China, do have a in kind of system engine effect, yes. In all citation data, that it helps. You, it also helps to explain why both the US and China don't have the foreign collaboration figures, don't have the, the co-authorship co figures that some other countries do, because they have so many internal collaborators to collaborate with. The, those factors do play a role, but that rate of increase, of course, can't be explained easily like that. It's clearly you know, a rate of increase in good science. Now, similar things happen, though, in, and maybe this is also underlines my point in response to Chris's question. If you look at Korea, Korea and Taiwan um, and Singapore are part of the a, a, a sort of other Asia group in these same data, and the, the rate of increase is not much less than the rate of increase in top papers in China. So Singapore, Korea and Taiwan as a group are also improving their top 1% and their top 10% papers at a very rapid rate. So there is something happening in terms of quality improvement in this station. And other systems will be well advised, I think, to look at it. This is um, these are some numbers for the, some of the stellar research universities in the region. And you can see in the last column the growth in the number of top 10% papers in the Leiden ranking over five years. Nanyang is the big emerging star. It's not far below NUS in some indicators, in fact its citation rate, its percentage of papers with high cites is slightly higher than in, at NUS. It's still not as big as NUS, and I wouldn't say it's as strong in terms of international strategy, for example, but it's certainly had a phenomenal improvement. Tsinghua is certainly a very successful university because it's very large, like some of the others, like Zhejiang, but it's also got high citation rates as well. China has two kinds of, of research universities. It's got um, very large ones, like Shanghai Jiatong and um, Tsinghua and uh, Zhejiang, with very strong sciences and engineering and so on. And it also has a group of medium-sized S&T players, like um, the Academy University, University of Science and Technology, or Nankai, Jilin, and so on. And they've got very good citation rates, but they don't have the volume. Um, but it's, a good, it's a, a good, good to have more than one kind of leading university in, in the system. 
because and it also has implications for the kinds of partnerships which can be formed as well. So it affects outside non chinese universities as well. You can see that so, Hong Kong's a great system, you know, five really strong universities, none of them really big. Balanced system um, and, and the quality across the board is pretty high in my experience. Um, not growing though, a mature system not growing at the same rate as Singapore. Um, and you could maybe that's you could say the same about Seoul National, you know, that it's probably had a lot, it's longer to establish itself. But interesting to see the comparison with, with MIT and Cambridge. That, MIT and Cambridge are increasing their, their number of high citation papers too, but they're mature institutions, obviously, they're well established, they're not growing at these phenomenal rates. Now, this is interesting. I just did these numbers last night. Um, the US National Science Foundation uses the um, Web of Science data from Thomson Reuters to, um, to measure collaboration, co-authorship co across international borders. And these figures can establish um, a... Um, these figures measure the comparative intensity of the collaboration relationship. Looking, the first figure looks at see all of these countries are partnering China and this, these, these numbers are measuring the intensity of the partnership with China as measured by co-authorship. Singapore 2.2, that's a very high collaboration rate. The collaboration rate is established by um, comparing the normal pattern of collaboration in country A and the normal pattern of country B in country B, establishing what would be the most the expected figure, making that 1.00 and then if the collaboration rate is twice as great, that means that there's twice as much activity going on, twice as much coefficient going on as you would expect given the overall collaboration patterns of both countries. So if one of the partners has got low, normally low collaboration rates, you can get rather inflated figures. But Generally speaking, in the larger countries, these are meaningful figures. The point I want to make here is that only Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, and the United States have collaboration with China higher than you would expect given the collaboration patterns of both countries in each partnership. That means people are not working with China as much as you'd expect, and that is partly because of the effect that Chris pointed to. Large system, people collaborate with each other, and so on. So with countries that are, are above the one point Zero, zero line here are significant players in China. And most countries are below that 1.00 level. You would say that's probably an unmet opportunity for some countries. When we go to Korea though with its you know, 15 million people, smaller country, like a medium to large European country, but not like China, much more <coughs> cross-border work. And what's really interesting is the way India and Korea have a special relationship in research. So, I mean, it's been showing up for a while in both countries. Korea and Japan, Korea and Taiwan, very regional. But there's also some other cases. Egypt doesn't have much collaboration, but what it does have, it has a lot with Korea. Russia too. Russia's not co-publishing much, but Korea's an important player in its co-publication. And the United States relationship is traditionally always there in Korea, in research. So, but you've got the whole of the first column are countries that are collaborating above the expected level. So more engagement with Korea, but some interesting exceptions, you know, like Australia's got low level engagement, Canada's got a low level engagement. Now, let's move to try and put some qualitative analysis into this whole quantit largely quantitative picture. I've said there are three major trends. The growth of participation towards high participation systems in almost every country the growth and spread of scientific capacity and the emergence of the movement for world-class universities and the sp spread of policies favouring world-class universities and to some extent achieving world-class universities in you know, a much larger number of countries and the rise of East Asia. I could have had a section on the rise of Latin America. It would have been less dramatic, although Brazil has seen some major growth in research and science, especially outside the universities actually. Um, and Argentina sort of and Mexico are not really progressing very fast, but Chile is doing well, and Venezuela and Colombia are clearly next kids off the, on the block. Um, but, it, but it's a more muted story compared to the East Asian story. You, I could also have talked about 
uh, Saudi Arabia, perhaps the Middle East and North Africa more generally, where there's clearly um, a lot of government fed, and the Gulf of course, a lot of government fed activity in research and science, especially in the Saudi Arabia. But they're but less spectacular than the East Asian story. Uh, but what we're seeing is in some respects a worldwide evening up. Latin America, fifth, you know, four, four decades of political peace and, and economic growth. East Asia now as rich as Europe, as you can see from the figures, except for Vietnam. China's, Eastern China is certainly at European levels already. Um, Beijing and so on, a region as well. Um, and, uh, and to some extent, I suppose, the, the Middle East where the power of money you know, does count. So you're seeing some even, evenness, if you like. You're seeing the Gini coefficient at the world level is, is because it's impossibly wide because it spans wealthy countries and countries with GDP per head of less than 200 US dollars. But it is, it is narrowing um, uh, the, worldwide, the worldwide Gini coefficient. So you are seeing a kind of trend to worldwide equalisation between countries. Yeah. The very, that's a very macro broad trend and there are exceptions, but that's the overall pattern. And of course, in the case of East Asia, it, catch up is real. I mean, if you could look at the way the level of number of scientific papers in the US is the grey background, the red bars coming up are China plus and the rest of East Asia, and see how the, the bars are now meeting the grey background. And in fact, we took the figures forward to 2015, I'm, there's no doubt the East Asian numbers will be higher. In fact, China will produce more papers than the US on present trends within the decade, and probably shorter, like five or six years, I would think. And, you know, world-class universities is just East Asia, but you could do this for Saudi Arabia, where it's created world-class universities out of nothing. Um, and you know, there are more in Latin America, there are more in, 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 in the Arab countries than there were. Um, but in China, big growth in the number of world-class universities. That should be 2015, sorry, 2014. And Taiwan as well. And in Europe too. Uh, I think it's been the competitive pressure that the AIWU ranking and other things have generated. Certainly the Lisbon strategy was about global competitiveness of Europe and science and technology are at the heart of that. Uh, and you, you do see now more European universities in the top 100 on all the measures, with the Swiss doing particularly well and the Dutch continuing to run a pretty strong system. The UK is not included in these numbers. The UK holds its ground in the top 10 universities at least. There are some more doubts further down. But this greater equalisation, this greater plurality of global knowledge power, if you like, um, with much larger number of countries with high participation education, much larger number of countries with scientific capacity, this pluralisation is, is occurring at the same time as the trend to greater income inequality as measured by Gini coefficients and similar measures in more than two thirds of countries. Not all countries. Latin America, which was the most unequal region on the Gini coefficient figures historically, is almost uniformly seeing a, with the modernisation process and with the more effective states, than there were in terms of transfers and so on, uh, taxation systems. It is seeing a reduction in uh, the Gini coefficient. So that, and Brazil being the most notable example, and, and OECD has been theorising that it's due to, due to education that this reduction is occurring in Brazil, but I'm not so sure. Um, but that, that's not the dominant pattern worldwide. In East Asia, um, on Gini coefficient figures, the modernisation process again is associated on the whole with reduction in inequality, certainly in the case of Korea Taiwan. Um, and Japan continues to maintain a relatively a medium level of inequality rather than high inequality. China it's more complicated by the rural urban divide drives um, continuing inequality. But um, the uh, movement of large the growth of the middle class means that the tendency for stratification in the society is offset by this huge absolute growth in the number of opportunities to rise up. So at the moment, even if the Gini figures are not showing it, China is becoming more equal in that social sense. But that's not the dominant pattern. And um, the, the, the dominant pattern in the English-speaking world, Western Europe, to a lesser extent, uh, is increasing inequality on all measures. Of course, the famous example, the one that, that probably matters the most in terms of driving 
overall trends is the United States. In um, the period before World War I, the top 1% in Europe, the old, old Europe, aristocratic Europe, still quasi-aristocratic Europe, took 20% of total income. That's very high. Um, the figure now is more like 10% in Europe, despite increased inequality in the last 20 years. The Nordic countries at one point got down to 7, that's very low. In fact, in some countries it was down to 5. But um, in the United States now, and the, all of the changes occur since 1980, since the Reagan years, since the Reagan tax, tax, tax cuts to 25% on the top marginal rate, um, and the um, breaking of the air traffic controller strike, and then the deunionisation of wage setting in many workplaces. Um, the United States, the top 1%, is now taking 20% again. So that's higher than it's ever taken in the United States in recorded history. Um, and it's back to the level of old Europe, old aristocratic Europe. The lower 50%, likewise, has had its share empty down. Piketty says that in, by 2030, the figure will be more like 25% for the top 1%. And the lower 50% will be taking 15% of the total take, compared to its 30% high point in the Scandinavian 1970s. So growing inequality, this, the data are so unambiguous. Yeah. Sorry, I, I hope you don't mind. Yeah. You did invite interruption. Yeah, of course. I'm just interested in the Nordic countries. Yeah. We're at 7% and 30%, but I'm just interested in that's classified as low inequality because that's. Yeah, it's uh, low. It is low inequality, but yeah. still, it's still a hell of a gap, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's low by historic standards by, you know, the nature of society. society. The there's still probably, social elite. I would have expected less in the top. So it was 5% in Sweden at one stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, a bit higher in and Finland, a bit higher in Denmark and Norway. Um, so it's just an interesting observation of what is regarded as low, given that it's not very... Yes. Deep. It's not 1%, no. no. <laughs> I mean, the, in Australia it got right down at one point. Um, well below 10%. Like There's sort of the seven or eight or nine, round about there in the 70s. Um, and Australia now? Uh, Australia and Canada have followed the US trend, as with, but not as much. Um, and Australia is now around about 12 to 15. And Canada's slightly higher. Although Canada's got more mobility, which is interesting than Australia has. The UK's followed the US more, more, more um, closely. And the UK is the second most unequal in terms of trends. There's no doubt about the data. At Atkinson, Piketty and Sayers have pumped out papers for 20 years and, and they've pretty well got cornered the market on the data. And while there's issues about interpretation, of course, um, there's not much doubt about the objectivity of the material. The income inequality was historically was driven by wealth was driven by property and financial holdings. Now, in the United States, it's predominantly been driven by high salaries for managers, super managers. Uh, we seem to have missed out on that uh, to a large extent in the education sector. But mm -hmm. our, high, our manager salaries are only, I'm afraid, a very, very, very weak echo of what's happening in the finance sector. Um, finance is the, is the major player here, and finance has more than twice the, its share of high salaries as to what its share of economic activity overall would suggest. Um, and of course, as you know, the very top of the salaries are very high, like in the, in the, in the many millions. Um, so that's, that's, that's this generation. In the next generation, those salaries get passed on to children, and they become inherited wealth, they become property income, and we go back to a more traditional pattern. But in, in this period, high inequality, growing inequality has been driven in a more quasi-meritocratic fashion by what people do at work, the risks they take, the burdens they carry at work. But of course, people set their own salaries at that level. <laughs> so the issue, the issue about merit is probably not fully decided. Now let's just, I just wanted to give you that backdrop about increasing inequality because it helps explain some of the other things that have been going on. Let's now swing to higher education. Um, a group of us, of which Glenn is part of the group, are working on um, a project which we call High Participation Systems, and one of the areas we've been looking at is stratification. And without taking you through the full theorisation, we've tentatively concluded that, um, and this is not unheard of, I mean, it's just following, I suppose, a Bourdieuian argument, although we don't use Bourdieuian reasoning, um, 
that uh, as, the, as you move towards mass and then universal education, the proportion of places in education which offer stellar opportunities shrinks as, a, as, as part of the total number of places. That is, this grows more than that grows in proportional terms. So the competition for this gets more and more intense. And um, middle class families are able to deploy all kinds of assets and resources to affect that, the outcomes of that competition. So uh, over time, you get an increased stratification and, and, and more vertical hierarchy of outcomes. Um, a number of things happen. One is that as you grow, you have a tendency for the stratification of institutions to occur. The other thing that happens is you have a tendency for stratification of, of opportunities and outcomes to get steeper as well. And this, and this shows up again and again in comparative studies, like the Shabbat et al. study of stratification in higher education in 2007. Uh, with its different national case studies. <coughs> pretty consistent pattern. I mean, there's some variations, but it was pretty consistent. Um, so, so we have this paradox that, you know, as you expand total participation, inequality tends to expand, get worse as well, unless states do something about it, or states and institutions do something about it. And of course, in some countries, they do. They, they, they mute those tendencies to grow inequality. But the disappointment, even in the Nordic countries, is that universal free education with a lot of emphasis on helping poor students from poor districts and so on at school level, hasn't really led to as much improvement in social mobility as everyone expected, um, even in the Nordic countries. So while clearly an egalitarian approach to educational participation of high quality is one of the things that sustains the social equality of those countries, it, it's, it would be, I think, now stretching the point to say that that's the, the major driver of Nordic egalitarianism. <coughs> So there's a whole range of ways in which we structure education that give, uh, create opportunities for differential outcomes and for the effects of social background to play out in outcomes um, through the agency of families. The point I made before about the drivers of participation being, um, being uh, family social demand for position, for opportunities for the children, that, that being the real principal universal driver in every country, not states, not the economy, but social demand for position now comes, becomes very important, doesn't it? Because if you think, see families as active agents in all of this rather than just passive respondents to economic forces or, or, or government policy. But if you see families as active agents, then you can see those ac active, active agency playing out in patterns of investment, in independent schooling, in, um, in, in, um, in learning the tricks of how you get into different kinds of programs and institutions. In, in being able to pay higher fees if you have more money, all those different ways in which social background can lead to stratified outcomes. And the more I look at this, the more convinced I am that social background is just, you know, you're inescapable. It just continues to play a major role in determining outcomes. And the game of policy is to modify it, not to abolish its effects. In uh, the United States, stratification shows up very directly. There's a lot of data. The great thing about American education is so much good data about the social character of the systems, um, and so you can have a proper discussion about it. The, uh, but in tier one, um, private universities, 64% of students are drawn from the top 10% of families. Yale estimates that only about 5% of American families can pay the sticker price, and so on. So, very simple point. Now, what we have then is a combination of trends. We have the trend to world class universities strengthening the top layer. Everyone wants good research universities and that of course attracts social um, investment as well. Good research universities are prestigious. They're attractive to top families. Top families want you know, being over backwards to get the children in and so on. Um, so you've got WCUs which tend to be, but although not universally, are dominated by middle class, upper middle class. Uh, and at the same time you've got great, great growth in access, but Country by country, very variable in quality. Uh, you could easily point to examples like Brazil and the Philippines and say there's diploma mills in huge numbers, the Indian private sector, 25,000 colleges with an average size of 500 students, unqualified teachers. They don't lead anywhere, it doesn't provide any mobility to another educational layer and so on. This is not very effective participation, this is not empowering, this is not very good for building job skills, it's not very good for building knowledge. Uh, and creating individual agency. So you can point to the problems and the weaknesses of mass education. So you, but you know, to some extent, 
the, the danger of impoverished mass education plays out in many, most countries, um, especially with government funding reductions and dependence, increasing dependence on private capacity. So you've got this scenario where in a kind of neoliberal period, I guess, in many countries, though not all countries, uh, some evacuation of the public investment, weakening of quality through that device, a tendency to look at things like MOOCs and say, okay, that can be a substitute for providing face-to-face -face education in real buildings, uh, and in some cases, and so on. And there's people in all kinds of countries, in California, trying to solve its budget problems. The governor, Jerry Brown, is convinced that MOOCs are a good substitute for normal education. Um, not as an adjunct, but as a substitute. So you've got this, you know, stratification effect of growth. You've got the concentration on world-class universities and investment in those, and you've got, in many but not all countries, evacuation of equality below that um, going on. And this is a serious and problematic scenario. And it may have implications for the long term for the participation rate as well. Let's take the example of the United States, because it's, it's the most important country in some ways. Um, the, the top bars give you the, um, the level of the gro um, gross tertiary enrollment ratio. That's anyone who enters an institution and enrolls formally through the administrative process, even if they leave a week later. So nearly everyone does that in the age cohort. Maybe inflated by mature age numbers, but you know, we, certainly we're looking at more than four fifths entering the institutions. The, the red bars give you graduation and degree level. So less than half, look at the gap. I mean, 40.1% degrees, 94.3% participation. So, and this too is an inflated, somewhat inflated figure. So, the inflation factor doesn't come in within the comparison between the two. But more than half of the age cohort doesn't graduate at degree level. They get a two-year program or they drop out. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's arguable that, that their participation has created any value. Because we're now at the stage in the US with a long history of participation where community college diploma has weak power in the labour markets and participation without a diploma has negligible power. So that's a big, a big evacuation, a big loss of participation. In um, the United States in 1970, 40% of the students from the top quartile in income terms, top family income quartile, 40% um, got a degree by age 24. So that percentage has now gone up to 77 percent on the last figures, 2013. So almost twice as many, like 77 percent, getting a degree by age 24. That's a pretty good success rate in the top quarter. Most countries would be very pleased to see that. However, it doesn't look so good when you go further down. The bottom quartile now, nine percent are getting a degree by age 24. Six percent are get in, in 1970. So not much change there. In the, in the virtual elimination of the bottom quartile from the early degree stakes. Not very good in the second quartile either, so basically more than four-fifths of the age group is not getting an early degree compared to the top quartile, most people getting an early degree. Some of these people will get there in the end, um, but you can see the disparity in income terms. That's very striking, and the fact that it's got worse in proportional terms is a serious problem. It needs to be said because at Oxford and Cambridge, there's a sense of inevitability about independent private school and middle class domination of the intake. Um, it needs to be emphasised that Berkeley and the other University of California system institutions, they have been able to maintain a strong role in social mobility. Um, with with um, Berkeley and UCLA together, taking in as many Pell Grant students as the top 16 private universities put together, the top 16 from Harvard down. The whole group, 16, um, with about 40% of Berkeley students not paying tuition on, on the basis of a means test, family means test, with two thirds of students graduating with no debt. So it is possible to largely eliminate the financial problem and to ensure that, as, as Nick Dirk says when he goes around the world talking about Berkeley, Berkeley and the other University of California campuses are a major engines for social mobility. In the American system, in low taxation California, in high individualistic California that invented Ronald Reagan and the New Right. So it is possible. 
and I, I, have, I have the utmost admiration for the University of California system, the way it's been able to maintain its public mission. Despite all the pressure to behave like Stanford and so on at Berkeley, people have held the line. And they still produce wonderful research outcomes. So it is possible, and so those of us who are in um, top institutions, um, I think, have got an obligation to tr reconsider the whole question of social access and to look at what Berkeley and the other UC campuses do, how they are able to sustain a much more representative and broader social entry than, um, than do most top institutions. And I mean, they're ob obviously Seoul National, BNU, University of Melbourne are not doing what Berkeley does. Maybe Toronto is, Glenn, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it. Now I move to wrap up and to get more, um, um, less definitive and more speculative. What really matters, I suppose, is our role in social mobility, and this is very hard to pin down. There are a lot of different figures about social mobility, and it's, it's a notoriously difficult area. I mean, the, the, the strongest numbers on social mobility relate to intergenerational income effects, the percentage uh, to which uh, the, the, the child's income derives from the social background of the, of the social income position of the, of the father or the parents, and so on. Um, we can also look at intergenerational um, comparisons on education, and that's what these OECD numbers do. Some of you will have seen these numbers before. Uh, they, they measure the odds ratios. Um, on one hand, the, the student from a family with, um, where the parents attended tertiary education. On the other hand, the student from the family where the parents had no tertiary education. Well, in the case of South Korea, they have about e almost equal chances, the two groups, of, 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 of participating in higher education. But in the case of the United States, the student from the tertiary education family has seven times the chance of participating as a student from the non-tertiary education family. In other words, in the US, and this shows up in all the figures in the US, that bottom 20% tends to, tends to stay, stay where it is. There's not much mobility out of that group. There's a lot more activity in the middle between the 40% the and the 70% mark. There's a lot of movement. Um, but there's not much movement out of the bottom 20. And there's not much dropping out of the top 20 either. But in the Nordic countries uh, with, these, with, with, with high social mobility, the position of someone from the top 20% is more precarious. They, they can fall, and the position of someone from the bottom 20% is much stronger. They can rise. So social mobility is a, is a fact, although it's hard to measure, and it's hard to establish to what extent education is the driver, as opposed to um, all the other effects, particularly um, social background itself. You can nominally, you can use mathematical calculations to rinse out the effects of, of social background, but I don't find those techniques persuasive. And um, it's a long discussion, but um, I take my uh, my um, uh, methodological lessons from Keynes' strategies on probability, who who just in it, which is a ten-year King's Fellowship dissertation, which is an invective against that kind of operation. Um, the um, position of Australia and Canada more intermediate, but Canada has better mobility figures than the other English-speaking countries. UK is US fairly similar. UK is worse than the UK. The UK is. If you're in the top 20% in the UK, you, or top 10%, you stay there pretty well. Um, you do it through independent schooling and, and through a privileged route to Oxford and Cambridge and so on. Um, but um, the position of people at the bottom 40% in the UK is a bit stronger than it is in some countries. They've got more chance. The point that I would to make here is that there's a strong statistical association between Gini coefficient high inequality measures and low mobility. That's, that correlation is, is well established and there's very little exception to it. The Korean figures are, are kind of confusing because some of the Korean figures show high mobility, some of them show mainly medium levels of mobility. The role of government is important here. In countries where um, there's relatively high, um, um, high social mobility, Government plays a stronger role in taxation through taxation and transfers in modifying market-based income distributions. The OECD produces two sets of Gini coefficients: one for income um, before taxation and transfers, government transfers; the other for income after taxation and government transfers. The difference between them is, of course, the role of government, the extent to which it modifies inequalities generated in the market. The role of government in the Nordic countries or Germany is. It's 35% to 40%. That is, it, it 
diminishes inequality by 35 to 40 percent. In the case of the United States, it's more like 25 percent. In Mexico, it's about 5 percent. In um, Korea, the, real, the effect of government is relatively weak, only about 10 percent. But the um, initial inequality in the marketplace is low, strikingly low. So Korea comes out as a medium mobility country on those numbers anyway. Um, but I think the East Asian pattern is different in a number of respects. In East Asia, the Korean and Taiwan examples show that you can have a relatively strong system in terms of quality, because it's closely regulated by the state. You can, with high private sector numbers and a very large private fee, or tuition or private cost numbers if you take into account um, the extra schooling outside normal schooling, uh, tuition and, uh, and, and extra classes. So you can have high privatisation in that sense, but you can have relatively good mobility outcomes and a relatively high standard education system across the board with very high um, school achievement levels as showing in PISA. So in the East Asian model, because of the family driver, because the family is so strong, the family will invest and, and that sustains uh, a level of equity higher than is the case elsewhere in the world. So, so, so can I, it's, a, it's a question you might want to leave to, to later. But if you could just tell me in a sentence, and other people around the table might be able to as well, how is higher education participation for users in Korea funded? Well, um, Korea spends more than 10% of its total GDP on um, public and private investment in education. The proportion of, um, according to the OECD data, the proportion of, of, um, of higher education costs which come from the household is the highest in the region. Of, about 72%, 73% in the Education at a glance is coming out in a week, so we'll have the new figures. But it's higher than Japan, which is the second highest. Um, so you've got relatively low level of state funding, um, yet you've got fairly strong level of state regulation with the private sector constantly complaining about the, the level of, of compliance required. Uh, and, and you've got relatively high, very high quality student population going into universities and coming out of, 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 of you know, all systems from SNU sorry, all institutions from SNU down to the weaker private institutions, you've probably, on an averaging basis, got a high quality of graduates. So I don't know what happens in the weaker private institutions. I don't know how strong they are, but my guess would be they're stronger than almost any, any counterpart private, weak private colleges elsewhere in the world. You, you, you may well want to enter the discussion on that. Um, anyway. Um, strong, co strong relationship between inequality and low mobility. Strong relationship between equality and high mobility. Uh, education. Uh, what's, how much of this is due to education? That's the question. And here we revisit the human capital argument. Because the United States is where all the human, so much human capital research has been done. Thousands of studies. There's a good case. I mean, there's surge in inequality in the last 20, 35 years, since 1980. Uh, even just since the recession, there's been a major shift towards greater inequality. To what extent is that being driven by education? I mean, if you take the human capital argument, um, education creates marginal productivity, creates earnings. And you do what we, everyone does, and you reverse engineer that, and you say that, well, that's the earnings pattern, therefore the education's good or bad. You know, go, go backwards down the chain again. And that's how everyone thinks, that's how everyone reasons about educational outcomes, about employability, all of that stuff, using it as an indicator to measure institutions and fields of study and so on. Uh, if, you, if you take that argument, then education's driving inequality. And in fact, in the inequality literature in the 90s and early 2000s, People were trying to find a way to say that it must be education, and then those arguments collapsed in the wake of the huge surge to inequality. You couldn't attribute super manager salaries and a blowout in the top 1% to 20% to education anymore. So, and the consensus in the inequality literature now is that social background, wage determination in the workplace, taxation policy are much more important than education. So we've got the human capital equation has now been, in a major way, qualified. We haven't come to terms with what that means. But what it does mean is that the employability indicator that we're all being hung on probably shouldn't be operating the way it is. Social background might be more important than what we do in determining people's income outcomes. 
certainly their starting salaries. There's a lot of literature showing that starting salaries are closely influenced by networking capability, and networking capabilities is influenced by family background. I think that we, we're part of a picture, we're not the driver of society, we're not the major player even. We're, part of, we're an important part of the mix. In some countries, education is more potent in determining effects than in others. My sense is about the United States to generalise very freely is that it's now a reproductive system. And that's what Suzanne Mellor says in Degrees of Inequality. It's, like, it's, it's, it's churning, turning over over our unequal society. It's not modifying it very much. There is, in, in, no, in terms of people's lives, yes, there is upward mobility and yes, there are opportunities for poor people through education. And if you took education out of the picture, everything would be worse. But it's not doing enough, to, it's not doing much or anything in the United States to change the patterns overall at an aggregate level. Um, in the Nordic countries, maybe it's more important, but it's more important because it's part of a, of a whole suite of egalitarian policies, which are ultimately driven by a state, a state which is supported by social consensus on the nature of citizenship and on rights and so on. Um, I, as I said, I think social background is, is as big or bigger than what, anything that we do. And we need to come to terms with that and what it means. Um, what I'm now really groping towards is trying to understand how we maximise the effects of higher education as a social force. Uh, I think that um, it works best in terms of providing opportunities for people from the bottom of society, providing social mobility, if its own institutions are very strong, that is, it's their autonomous and their professional mission in terms of teaching and learning and also assessment and selection is maintained with integrity. One of the most serious trends in the present environment is the shift away from cognitive formation and towards social networking and peer networking and so on as a core aspect or core purpose of higher education. There's a very well documented American trend um, which, is pick, which, which we're picking up with our emphasis on student satisfaction here and uh, which is beginning to evacuate quality. Um, a related problem is when you're measuring um, the careers of, of faculty or academic staff according to their student ratings, then you find that increasingly faculty or academic staff teach down. They keep the students happy rather than challenging them. They reduce the cognitive formation. Um, the, the inflation of grade point averages to try and improve student satisfaction is another aspect of the same problem. The more we erode the core professional mission, the weaker our capacity to change social outcomes. The, the best opportunity for the poor student lies in, not in the provision of an emphasis on social capital and cultural capital where they are uncompetitive, but lies in an emphasis on cognitive formation so that hard work can get them through. Um, that's, it's always been the case, and it's a very basic and obvious point, but it's actually one of the things now, variables now in the mix. So issues about standards, slippery and elusive as they are, are really quite central to sustaining the capacity of education to provide broad upward mobility and this is why I think you look to societies where cognitive formation at school level is really strong, where there's a very strong tradition of high quality teaching, where mathematics and language performance, as shown in PISA, is high, to, 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 to understand, I think, why mobility is relatively good as well. And, in the, and the two cases are the East Asian case, Korea especially, and the, the Nordic case. And in both those cases, but with a very different mix of social institutions and balances between public and private, you're getting this combination of good mobility outcomes with very high quality education which maintains its integrity. Very interesting. So it is possible to do it, but you need, I think, a social consensus. You can't afford to have British or Australian style independent schooling, crawling the, pat the patch, providing a, an avenue for ten the top 10% of families to invest in a special advantage. That, that makes a mess of it for everyone. So, as I said, it gets more flaky and more diffuse as we go, but I think more interesting. Um, so, I, I reflect on what we do. We form the state machine. That used to be a core role of higher education in the public mind. I think it's very important. I think in, in, maybe in China that role is understood better than it's understood now these days in the UK, but it's still very important in what we do. But it's not a, a front rank emphasis in the public discussion. 
formation of human capital and allocation of people to jobs. That's what people think primarily is what we're doing. My argument would be, and it's a longer paper, is that we don't do this very well, but we, no one can do it very well. Um, half the people who get trained for specific jobs don't go to those jobs. Some of the jobs that require specific qualifications are not filled by people trained in those fields. Many people do generalist degrees. Often it's about position rather than about human capital, and so on. Um, and there's great increasing differentiation in labour market outcomes for graduates. Um, we've got a project in our new research centre which is looking, Francis Green is looking exactly at that issue, those patterns. The third thing we do is we allocate people to social positions. Yes, we do. And I think everyone understands that's why they're in education. But I would argue that social background might matter more. It looks like we're doing it for society. We're a legitimation operation. It looks like we're doing it, but there's, you know, what we're doing is we're providing an articulation and a filter for the effects of social background on outcomes. How much we modify it is up to us, but perhaps also up to the society and its preparedness to give us the autonomy and the institutional structures that allow merit to flourish. Provision of a ladder for upward mobility and social equaliser. When we discussed high participation systems at the recent Ash conference, Glenn, in his summing up, said, maybe we're not the social equaliser we all thought we were. And I think that's, that's the lesson, I think, of the last 50 years, that we, we've produced this wonderful level of social participation. We've uplifted the literacy. We've provided uh, technical and scientific skills to an enormous number of people. But um, we haven't provided the social equalisation that we promised to provide and that everyone thought we were going to provide. Contribution to forming civil society, I think it's of utmost importance in a country like China, which is where you have a wonderful, there's a wonderful state, but the civil society needs to be there to balance the state. Education is enormously important in developing that, that future civil society in China. But that role of education is not generally understood or discussed except by the educators who talk about citizenship and those sorts of things. So uh, there's something wrong about the perception of higher education and the you know, in relation to reality. The, all the emphasis is falling on its allocation role and particularly on its human capital functions when there's other things that we need to be able to bring forward. So in summary, and to sign off on the presentation, high growth for the foreseeable future, everywhere, except where it's already grown, almost the universal levels, but quality is entirely up, up in the air. Government funding continues to be a significant factor. It's less crucial in East Asia where the family attitude to education sustains participation even in the lowest echelons and where um, high quality outcomes come out of low status institutions to a greater degree than elsewhere. Um, the role and responsibility of higher education as a central player is exaggerated, seriously exaggerated. There's a danger of neglecting the socialisation and cognitive functions. Our contribution to mobility is weaker than we thought. Uh, and in some countries it's clearly been overwhelmed by the trend to inequality. Stratification seems to be inherent in the growth and it's also being driven by unequalising tendencies, greater competition, withdrawal of government funding, and so on. Um, but it is possible to modify stratification, and I think that is a key to doing, expanding the allocative social function of education to ensure that a much larger number of institutions have reasonable status and reasonable quality, which means not pulling the top ones down, but bringing the middle ones up. I think the second and third tier is really crucial. And in UK, you'd say, a strength of the UK is that the Russell Group is quite large, but a weakness in the UK is that FE is buried in, in the public mind in terms of status and resources. Um, it seems to me that, we, that if you're going to raise questions of social justice, the first place to go is to not look at the boundaries of participation on the weak parts of the system, but to look at what's happening in the high demand elite institutions. To return to that question, which was historically an important question, um, and where this, in, in this country, great work being done recently by uh, Vicky Bolivar and uh, Anna Knowles and uh, John Jerome from this institution, for example, pu published major papers in that area recently. Um, graduate earnings, dispersion will get worse. Average earnings, while I'll stay above school leaver earnings, um, will come back to the social average. If costs keep on increasing as they are in the United States, even in the public system, 
then there comes a point where families, poorer families will say, it's not worth participating anymore. The average earnings are lower than we thought and the costs are higher. At that point, um, the trend to high participation may reverse and I think that's what's happening in the United States with a, with a fall in absolute levels of participation as well as this weak graduation rate. So that might be a sign of things to come in other high participation systems but this is a very unequal society and where the cost of, private costs of higher education have blown out so it's not a necessarily representative. But, but that trend is a worry. I think that's where questions about over in educational um, may be in fact become more manifest than they are elsewhere. Um, to, to maintain a high participation society, it will be necessary to reduce stratification and particularly to lift the quality of the bottom two thirds of the institutions. That's all I was going to say in the presentation, um, but we might have some discussion. Uh, Simon, I've been asked to chair the session, which is entirely unnecessary, perhaps I can facilitate some of the conversation. But maybe I can also start off. I, I've been thinking about Fields' point when he started at the very beginning, and that is the assumption, uh, we, we know that in some of these systems, almost all of this high participation takes place uh, post-school, pre-career. Um, but in others, there is a kind of uh, notion of, uh, the umbrella of lifelong learning, the notion of individuals returning to higher education at later stages of their career but most of which takes place in sort of high absorbing mass institutions. Is, I'm just wondering whether or not it's possible to argue that, 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 that lifelong learning actually increases stratification within a higher education system. Um, or to put it the other way, that, that maybe uh, there's greater social equity if the huge investment is at the front end. In other words, if there's an assumption that you should get most of your higher education post-school pre-employment, that actually might be a philosophy for, for I'm just playing with the idea, but I appreciate your thought. I mean, John's actually done more work on this than I have, but um, I, I mean, I remember the uh, the data we looked at in Australia in relation to mature age entry was that showed that the social background of students was relatively affluent and uh, compared to the, the intake of first degree students. And uh, so that might play into your point about stratification. Um, the, uh, but I think, though, that um, it's, you know, the the, the role of second chance and, and, and later entry is really attractive. You know, that, that notion of lifelong education should be a central part of any well-designed, socially equitable system. Uh, how you get people who missed out the first time coming in, I'm not sure. But in the UK, we're, we're currently... The